We're going to be starting the chapter on burns today. So the first slide talks about burns and, um, you know, as far as the occurrence of burns go, burns, they don't discriminate against any group. Every age group, whether you're a child, an adult, uh, in uh, older ages, male or female, and regardless of what type of a setting you're in. So, you know, you could be a cook at a restaurant, or you could be a engineer at a steel factory, or, you know, you can be a, a chemist in a laboratory. Uh, you could be a housewife uh, at home. You can be uh, a teacher, a school teacher. Everybody is susceptible to, to burns. So it doesn't, uh, it's not limited to a specific gender, an age group, or even, um, you know, or your work type, or the type of work that you do. So essentially burns, you know, they, what a burn exactly is, is that, you know, it's, it's skin dying. So it's a necrosis of your integument. So this will result from some type of an injury, such as a, a heat injury, or it could be a chemical injury. And we're going to be going over the different types of, uh, the different causes for injury. But essentially, when um, skin death and injury, you know, it occurs as heat, the heat that's coming from the source, exceeds the body's ability to disperse that heat. So more heat is coming onto you than your body is able to, to remo remove that. And this depends on, on several factors. So it's, uh, it could be the intensity of the heat. It could be the duration of contact that you have with that source of heat. And also another factor, an important factor, is the thickness of the skin. Different parts of our body have different uh, levels of thickness of the skin. So if you remember back to your anatomy class, you know, your skin, depending on the area, there could be four or five layers of, um, of cells in the epidermis. <clears throat> as far as uh, thermal causes of heat, so again, when you look at the word thermal, Thermal means, again, heat burns. And heat burns, they could be caused by a flame, so some type of a fire, or it could be a hot object. Additionally, you know, um, thermal heats, they could be caused by flammable vapors uh, or steam as well. In addition to that, hot liquids. So sometimes, you know, someone gets a, a cup of coffee, a hot, hot coffee or tea, and uh, by mistake, they ended up spilling it. It falls onto themselves and they end up uh, burning themselves. So the next classification for burn are chemical burns. And chemical burns are caused by a wide range of chemicals. And they typically fall into being either acids, alkalis, or even organic compounds can result in a, a chemical burn. When we look at electrical burns, electrical burns, they're caused by contact with an electric current. And the injury is gonna depend on the type of current, on uh, the voltage, the, again, the area that's exposed. Uh, in addition to that, it's also dependent upon how long that uh, exposure is. So the duration of contact to that source is also another factor uh, in the electrical burns. So how do you evaluate a thermal burn? So, you know, to an extent, uh, it's gonna dep dep depend on the depth of the burn. So we have three different criteria that we use in terms of determining the depth of burn. Burns, um, there's first degree burns, which are, which is what you see over here. And this is a superficial burn. So first degree burns, a very easy example is that, yeah. could result from the sun. So a lot of times children, uh, they'll go outside in the summertime, perhaps they're at the pool or they're sitting at the beach playing in the sand under the sun and they don't have a shirt on, or maybe they do have a shirt on, but you know, it's very thin and it's not, uh, it's not, it doesn't have any UV uh, protection. So that ends up, you know, they end up uh, at the end of the day, they have a, a they feel a heat on their back. Usually, typically the back is involved because the surface area is the largest over there and they're usually hunched over if they're playing in the sand, for example. Uh, so this is where they end up having, they end up getting burns, especially it's common in children, even in adults. 
So again, these are first degree burns. So these are very superficial burns where only the epidermis is involved. Now, moving on to second degree burns. As far as second degree burns go, this is called a partial thickness burn. And second degree burn, again, it involves the epidermis, but it also uh, has a certain level of um, dermal involvement as well. So it's the epidermis as well as the dermis. Now, again, it's a partial thickness burn. So not the entire uh, dermis may be involved, but again, a small part of it may be. And one of the ways that you distinguish a first degree burn from a second degree burn, again, just by looking at these photographs, uh, you'll see that in a first degree burn, your skin is just, it appears red. Um, whereas in a second degree burn, you start to see blisters that form. So again, you see these are pockets where there's fluid accumulating. So again, this is a second degree burn. Now, as you move on, as you move on to third degree burns, third degree burns, they involve, first of all, third degree burn is referred to as a full thickness burn. So again, third degree burns, full thickness burns. And in a third degree burn, you will have involvement of all the layers of skin. So it's the epidermis, the dermis, and a lot of times, again, the subcutaneous is gone also. So again, it's the entire integument. Uh, what ends up happening is, you know, and many times you'll be able to see the underlying tissue. So you may see muscle, or, or again, in extreme cases, you know, you may even see bone that's present. Uh, so these are third degree burns are very serious. So how do you determine the extent of a burn? So what they do is that uh, we use the, and we estimate how much of the body surface has been affected. So, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine the body surface area the burn covers. And we use the rule of nine. So if you look at this photograph over here, uh, the, in an adult, if we'll start off with the image that's all the way on the right over here. Uh, the arms they represent, the front of the arms represent 9% of the body. Uh, the front of the torso is 18%, and the posterior aspect of the torso, your back, that will also be 18%. The other arm is 9%. Uh, the, the legs are 18%, again, front side, and you, know, you go to the back, that's, that's additional. Uh, so when you, and then the, the pubic region is 1%, the head will be 9%. So when you do the math, it all adds up to 100%. Uh, when it comes to ch children and infants, the numbers are different. So again, what is similar is that you have 18% for the torso and uh, the head is 12%. And then uh, the legs are different over here. It's about 16.5% compared to the 18 in, in adults. When you look at an infant, an infant, again, the torso remains the same throughout. So we're at 18% as well as the, the arms are all at 9%. Uh, what's different over here is it's gonna be the legs. So we have 13.5% compared to 16.5 in, in a child and 18 in an adult. So again, this is how, this is referred to as the rule of nine. And um, <clears throat> another, method that, that's used to determine uh, the burn area is by your hand. So we can also determine the extent of the burn by what's referred to as is the rule of hand. And essentially this says the hand represents about 1% of a person's total body surface. So if you take your arm and you put it on the burn and you know the burn is the size of, of uh, I'm sorry, so if you take your hand and you place it on the burn area and if that equals that burn area, then you're saying you're at 1%. That person has a 1% burn. So determining which parts of the bodies are burned. So um, burns on the face, hands, feet, and genitals are the most severe. Circumferential burns are more severe than non-circumferential burns. So what does it mean for a circumferential burn? Circumferential burn, again, when you look at the term circumferential, Circumferential means circumference. This is where the term comes from. So for example, let's just use a finger, which is very easy uh, to look at. So you can see the front. If you supinate your palm, you'll be able to see the, the front of your finger. And then if you pronate it, you'll be able to see the back of the finger, as well as, uh, again, if you 
go from a, a supine position to a prone position, you'll be able to see the lateral aspects of your finger as well. So if the entire circumference of your finger all around front, sides, back, this is what's referred to as a circumferential burn. And if there's only one side that's burned, then we, we refer to that as a non-circumferential burn. So superheated air can be absorbed by the upper respiratory tract. So again, when we're evaluating burns, it's important to determine if there's any respiratory involvement. And uh, swelling of the respiratory, air, uh, respiratory tract, it could occur anywhere from two to 24 hours. And the problem with that is, is that it's gonna restrict or shut off the airway you know, when the swelling starts. Uh, less air is gonna be moved in, then that person, the, the patient will go into, uh, they'll have difficulty breathing, dyspnea, and that will lead to other complications. So what do you determine? Well, first of all, you have to determine whether there's other injuries present. Is it just a burn you're looking at or is there perhaps bleeding that's occurred? Are there any puncture wounds? Uh, so again, is there a fracture? So you have to be thorough in your examination. Other things to consider is if there's any pre-existing medical conditions that the patient suffers from. If, they, if there are any pre-additional medical conditions, then again, you have you know, other risk factors that come along with it. If the patient is more than 55 years old, they're at a higher risk group. And also if the person is younger than five years old, they're at an increased risk for um, complications from forming. And how do we determine burn severities? So if you look at this graph, so essentially what they say is this, as far as severity of burns go, well, uh, for minor burns, when it comes to first degree burns, these are areas that are covered less than 50% of the body surface area in, in adults. Uh, or when, if you look at a second degree burn, for second degree burns, for it to be considered a minor burn, you're talking about body surface areas where there's less than 10% uh, that's being affected. And um, in children, second degree burns covering less than 10% body surface uh, uh, as well. So as far as uh, minor burns go, you know, they're limited to first and second degree burns. And in the case of second degree burns, we're essentially we're looking at less than 10% body surface area. In terms of moderate burns, moderate burns for first degree burns, this is when more than 50% of the body surface is involved in adults. For second degree burns, this is when you have between 15 to 30% of body surface area in uh, body surface area involvement in adults. And in children, we're talking about between 10 to 20% body surface area involvement. Moderate burns also includes third degree burns. And in third degree burns, we're talking about 10%. So if there's, uh, and this is in adults. So if there's 10% body surface area involvement for a third degree burn, the person is said to have a moderate burn. Now, critical burns, these are the more serious burns. So the first thing to notice is that in the critical burns, first degree is not included. Critical burns, they start at second degree. So these are only second and third degree burns. So if the second degree burn in adults is greater to or equal to, it's greater than 30%, then they're said to be classified as having a critical burn. Or in the case of children and older adults, we're talking about more than 20% body surface area involvement. For third degree burns, if in adults, if there's more than 10% body surface area involvement, then they're at a critical stage. Or again, when uh, you're looking at children and there's greater than 2% body surface area, uh, then they're at critical. And the same is true for older adults. In, third, uh, in the critical burns, third degree burns of your hand, face, feet, or genitalia, or also uh, respiratory uh, inhalation injuries or electrical burns, uh, electrical injuries, uh, and uh, other burns that could be, you know, that come, that result from uh, major traumas, or if they have any significant pre-existing conditions, 
may also be classified as a critical burn. So what are some of the signs and symptoms for first degree burn? So I kind of mentioned before, essentially what you're gonna see is redness, you'll see mild swelling. Uh, there may be, again, swelling, it may or may not be present, but if it is, it's gonna be very mild. Uh, aside from that, there's gonna be tenderness when you palpate and um, there's pain. So it's, it's rather painful. There is a burning sensation uh, or, you know, it's also um, where the patient will want to scratch it and they're going to feel a lot of heat coming from that area. So these are the signs for superficial first degree burns. So what do we do when you have a first degree burn? Um, easiest thing to do and, you know, something that you can do right away is just apply cold water to it. Uh, put your arm under running cold water or, water or submerge your arm under cold water. You can also use a cold compress if that's available. Uh, in addition to that, you can give the patient uh, a, uh, an NSAID, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, such as uh, ibuprofen. Uh, if the arms or legs are involved in first degree burns, you, may, you can uh, elevate the arms or legs. And the other thing that's important is to stay hydrated. So give the person a lot of water to drink. The other thing, other thing that's rather effective is to apply some type of a lotion or what I find best is an aloe vera, uh, aloe vera gel, or you know, if you can just get an aloe plant, crack open that plant and take the, the contents out and, and spread it onto the skin. It's highly effective, it's very cooling and it, uh, it heals uh, amazingly well. So, Let's continue with the, what are some of these signs and symptoms for secondary burns and what do you do about it? So in secondary burns, as we saw earlier, there are blisters that you'll see. There's gonna be edema that's present. In addition to that, you may, or again, sometimes you may not see fluid that's weeping from these blisters. And there's gonna be a lot more pain involvement than a first degree burn. So we can say that it's severe pain How do we treat this? What do we do? So you wanna follow the first steps for um, in treatment in uh, first degree burns. But in addition to that, you also wanna apply antibacterial ointment. You can cover it with a loose, a dry, a nonstick sterile dressing as well. For Second degree partial thickness burns. Again, follow the first three steps for first degree burns. You can apply cold. And when you do that, you also wanna monitor for hypothermia. After that, you wanna call 112. Again, second degree burns, you wanna call, this is what you wanna do, you have to do this. You have to call 112 because again, there's um, dermal involvement the risk of infection is higher. The risk of fluid loss is uh, rather high, especially in those high risk groups when you're looking at children and the, uh, the elderly, people of older age. Moving on to third degree burns, or in other words, full thickness burns. So what are some of the signs? You're gonna see dry, uh, uh, dry uh, dryness that, that'll be present, uh, lethargy, you'll see gray colored or charred skin. And what do you do? So cover the burn with a dry, non-stick sterile dressing if it's available, and then you wanna call 112. Okay, this is something that you have to call. You need to get the emergency medical response, uh, medical services involved. The patient needs to go to an emergency room, preferably a burn center. As far as later care goes for thermal burns, you wanna follow the whatever recommendations the doctor gives, the physician gives. Uh, in, in, the, in addition to that, uh, you should always uh, follow uh, um, protocols to reduce transmission and, and risk of infection to that patient. So that's as simple as, you know, washing your hands before changing the dressing, washing your hands afterwards, wearing gloves, of course. If you're looking at blisters, there's blistering present, do not break them open, leave them intact. The other thing is to have uh, to change the dressings daily, and you want to monitor for signs of infection. Uh, for the first 24 hours, you know the burn. The, you want to uh, elevate the body, the, the limb, if it's a limb or the body part, 
uh, that's been burned. As far as pain management goes, you want to give them medication if it's necessary. And unfortunately, there will be a lot of pain. So a lot of times, uh, an ibuprofen may be sufficient, or in other cases, um, narcotics may be, or opioids may be given to help the patient deal with the pain so they can manage it better. For scalding burns, so this results when your skin comes into contact with hot liquids. Uh, so again, you know, they could be thought of as an immersion burn. So again, when areas of the body end up being immersed or fully immersed in a hot liquid, or they can also result from spill burns. So, you know, your liquid, uh, you know, you end up uh, having uh, spilled some type of a hot liquid, such as coffee, a tea, or soup that, that's hot. It accidentally, you knock it over, it falls on top of your thighs or your legs. Other times, it may even be drops. So, you know, a drop of uh, hot water or a drop of oil, it, uh, you know, it, uh, it splatters and then it comes into contact with skin. So, this is what's referred to as a, a scalding burn. So again, when you're looking at sunburns, again, sunburns, remember, this is um, a superficial burn or first degree burn, and it, res it results from UV radi radiation. Again, it's coming from the sun, hence the name sunburn, and the sun emits ultraviolet radiation. So this is the skin's response to trauma from that ultraviolet radiation. Um, when we talk about care for sunburns, uh, what do we do? So in terms of temperature control, you know, you want to apply a cool compress for up to 45 minutes, or you can submerge the body part, the limb in cold water. Uh, if it's, you know, if your back is involved, you may want to stand under a cold shower head, um, or, you know, just submerge yourself in, in a bathtub with cool water. Um, one thing that you want to avoid as far as pain goes, you don't want to use benzocaine, like a, benz a topical benzocaine cream. That's going to end up, um, it'll end up uh, making things worse rather than better. Instead, take an NSAID such as ibuprofen to reduce the pain and also the uh, in inflammation. I think in Turkey, perhaps there's something called a Voltron that's available. Uh, again, you want to stay hydrated. So drink a lot of water, lots of fluids. If you have any electrolyte drinks, such as a Gatorade or Powerade, uh, or even Pedialyte, that ends up being an excellent source for, uh, for staying hydrated and also replacing electrolytes. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, topicals such as an aloe vera, or, uh, aloe vera gel or uh, another type of um, a body lotion or body cream end up working very well. For another thing that could be done for topical burns is to apply some type of an antibiotic ointment. Um, if there's, you know, especially if there's any uh, blisters that, that may form. But again, remember, you're not going to see these in sunburns. Uh, but if it does, you know, if there is any, you know, you have a small area where there may be a blister. First of all, you don't want to pop it. You don't want to break it. Don't rupture that. Uh, keep it clean, monitor it. It'll let it open up on its own uh, if it does. And just wash it twice a day, gently wash it two times a day. And if it appears to get infected, then you know you wanna go to a, to a doctor. But generally speaking, first degree burns, especially sun, uh, sunburns, they don't really require you to go seek medical care. You know, This is something that could be managed at home. But again, if there's any eyes that are involved, or again, you see, if you start to see signs of infection, this is when you want to seek professional help, professional medical treatment. For uh, chemical burns, chemical burns, again, they're going to be resulting from uh, acids or an alkaline substance when it comes into contact with the skin. Now, chemicals are going to cause you to feel a burning sensation as long as they stay in contact with the skin. So with that said, you want to remove the source. You want to remove the source of that burn from your body. You know, if it's a flame, it's rather easy. You just move your arm away from the fire. 
Uh, but so when it comes to chemicals, again, when chemicals come into contact with you, it's uh, sometimes they may not be as visible. So again, you want to remove yourself from the source of that burn, whatever's come into contact with your skin. The other thing to do is you want to check the material safety data sheet. So you know this is this MSDS, the material safety data sheet. So uh, and again, this essentially it states that what is this material, what is this chemical, what what the properties are. And essentially, it will tell you what to do. It'll have some uh, general instructions uh, in terms of um, treating for, for treatment. Again, usually in the emergency rooms, they have MSDSs that are available. Uh, and then also, any like a factory, they're required by law to carry whatever, su whatever substance that they're working with or, or chemicals or compounds that they have. They need to have um, the material safety, safety data sheets for that. Uh, and again, this is specific, specifically for uh, cases where, you know, there may be a spillage or some type of injury uh, if uh, anyone gets involved, comes into contact with, with those uh, chemicals and uh, how to treat it <clears throat> or what, uh, what uh, precautions they should take because of the spill or exposure to said chemicals. So when you look over here, again, uh, this individual's uh, backside, it looks like one side, it's left side of the back. Uh, appears to be burned, and this is coming from a chemical burn. So chemical burns, they are painful, so you will have pain that's involved. You'll have a burning sensation. They can also result in breathing difficulty, again, just from the vapors and fumes. So there may be some level of respiratory involvement as well. There could be pain in the eyes or, again, changes in vision. Again, as sometimes, depending on what chemical it is, as they start to... Um, and as the heat starts to disperse and the fumes start to come up, again, this is when you start to breathe in and when your eyes may come into contact with it. So, you know, <clears throat> you have to be aware of that. Fumes that come off from chemicals. So what do you do when you have chemical burns? So again, if the chemical, if you see it, you have to remove it from the skin. So, you know, if it's a dry chemical, try to brush it off your skin. Try to brush that chemical off the skin if that's possible. Um, the other thing is you want to flush the burn with large amounts of water for at least 20 minutes or until the emergency medical services arrive. So again, when I say, you know, until the emergency medical services arrive, that means you have to call 112 for these individuals. They need advanced care. They need to go to a, uh, to a doctor, to a hospital, to a medical, sen uh, medical center. What do we do when we have chemicals in the eye? So first of all, you want to tip the head so the affected eye is below the level of your nose. Then you want to wash your eye with warm water from uh, the nose to the side of the face. This is how you wash it with. And you want to continue this for at least 20, minute, 20 minutes or again until EMS arrives, until the, one, the people from 112, they, they end up coming. <clears throat> Moving on, so what we see over here, this is an electrical burn. So uh, now electrical burns, again, they could be, they could result from thermal burns. So they could be a flame that's involved, or it could be an arc burn. And an arc burn, essentially we're talking about a flash that's involved. Or it could be what's referred to as, as a true electrical injury. This is when there is direct contact with the current. Okay? So direct contact is involved for that. So outdoor power lines. So now before you go, you know, if there's a, a, a power line that's down, okay, or, you know, someone has, is in contact with a power line outside, perhaps it's due to a storm or, I don't know, some other, perhaps a branch fell onto it because of high winds, whatever this, uh, the, the case may be. The power, it has to be turned off, okay, before you go anywhere near it, right? Otherwise, you're going to be the second victim. And again, you have to protect yourself before you can go and help somebody else. Otherwise, you have more and more victims and it becomes, you're putting more people at risk. So the power must be turned off. Now, if you approach the area and you start uh, having a tingling sensation, this ends up signaling to you that you're in an you're on energized ground, meaning that there's live current that's flowing. So at that point, you want to raise one foot off the ground, turn around, and hop back as, as far as you can to a safer area. 
do not attempt to remove or move any type of wirings. Again, you're not prepared for it. You don't know what to do and you don't have any equipment uh, to do that. So what about if there's a, some um, electrical disturbance or a wire that's uh, being grounded inside of a building? So again, some type of electrical power comes down in a building. And this could be from, I mean, it could be from the main breaker or it could even be coming from one of your appliances. So first of all, you want to turn off the electricity, okay? And what's the best way to do that? Perhaps there might be a switch on the wall, but even better than switches on the wall is to go for the main circuit breaker that we all have in the house. Or, you know, if you want to go one step further beyond that, you go to the, the where the electrical meter is and you can just shut off that circuit over there at that point. The next thing you want to do is you want to unplug the appliance. Uh, after you uh, unplug the appliance, at that point, it would be, again, you want to use your judgment. You want to observe to make sure that there aren't any other sources of electricity, currents that you can hear. Perhaps you can hear the, uh, the current uh, fizzling. So um, again, don't touch the uh, appliance or person until all the current's off. And again, you don't hear any other sounds, any source of current as well. So now with these uh, electrical injuries, they may not be evident at first. In other words, we're talking about occult. There's an occult injury or occult trauma. So the damage occurs underneath the skin. So what do you want to look out for? Well, again, <clears throat> first of all, do you hear any current that's still active? That's one thing that you want to do. Um, when you start to make observations, you, you may notice that burn wounds, they're rather small. Okay, so they, they're not gonna be, they may not be very large, but typically speaking, they tend to be smaller in, in size. And there may be an entrance as well as an exit wound. So entrance and exit wounds may or may not be present. In addition to that, there could be multiple burns. Or, you know, that person may be, they may not be breathing or they may not have a pulse. So one thing that you want to do is, you know, you want to monitor the patient for their airway. Make sure uh, they have an open airway. They can open their mouth. You want to make sure that they're breathing. And you want to also make sure that there's circulation that's taking place. In other words, do they have a pulse? Is their heart beating? So, you know, the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. This is something that's uh, of utmost importance. So what do you do okay, when you have electrical burns? So first of all, again, after you check the ABCs and you know you, you look to see if there's any so obvious signs uh, of an entrance wound or versus an exit, exit wound, wound, or if there's any other significant injuries that are present, you want to call 112 right away. So you want to activate the EMS and um, start, start treating the person for shock, cover the wounds, if you have sterile dressing, cover the wounds with sterile dressing. Keep the person warm. Um, expose, expose the, uh, the the areas that may be susceptible to that injury. So this is it for this current uh, topic. Thank you for watching.